Thank you, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. My name is Brett Schaefer, and I'm the Jay Kingham Fellow in International Regulatory Affairs at Heritage. I'm pleased to welcome you to our conversation with Brian Hook on keeping pressure on Iran through the UN Security Council. We're thrilled that you're able to join us today. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. First, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on heritage.org slash events within 48 hours of the webinar. It will also be emailed to you. Second, we encourage questions and comments. Please submit them through the questions tab throughout the webinar. We have reserved time for Q&A at the end, but we encourage you to send those questions throughout the event. Today, I have the pressure, I uh, have the pleasure of introducing Brian Hook. Brian is the U.S. Special Representative for Iran and Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary of State. Prior to this appointment, he served as Director of Policy Planning Staff from 2017 to 2018. From 2009 to 2017, he managed an international strategic consulting firm based in Washington. Prior to that, he held a number of senior positions in the Bush administration, including Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations, and senior advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. In short, he is the perfect person to talk about how the Trump administration plans to keep pressure on Iran through the UN Security Council. Today's event will be a conversation in two parts. First, Brian and I will discuss various issues related to this topic. Then the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions on their own. So, Brian, thanks so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. But before we dive in directly into Iran and the UN Security Council, I was wondering if you wanted to discuss the release of US Navy veteran Michael White, who was held in Iran for almost two years, and how all that happened. Well, first, Brett, thank you. You and I have worked together for many years, and I think this is the first uh, virtual interview we've done. Uh, I remember just almost uh, two years and one month ago when Secretary Pompeo came to Heritage and unveiled uh, our new Iran strategy. And so to be able to talk about that uh, two years later is a great pleasure. Uh, you mentioned Michael White. Uh, I'd been negotiating with the Iranians uh, for the last few months through the Swiss. We don't have any direct talks with the regime, um, but we have um, the Swiss embassy in Tehran. That is our what's called our protecting power. And so for the last few months, I've been engaged in talks um, with the regime to see if we can get freedom for those Americans who are wrongfully detained. This regime has a 41 year history of taking hostages, going back to when they took our diplomats hostage in 79. So it's always a good day uh, for America when we bring an American home safely. Uh, Michael White is a 13 year Navy veteran and uh, he's a survivor, he's a, he's a pretty tough guy. He, he had survived cancer. He survived two years in an Iranian prison. He contracted COVID while he was in prison and survived that. And then you know, we were able to get a medical furlough for him to get treatment for COVID. And then he recovered and we were able to negotiate his release with the regime. And uh, so I flew over to Zurich last week and um, he was handed off to us by the Swiss. And then we, we flew back to the United States and He's with his family, so it's great. Um, this is now the second American um, whose who's wrongful detention uh, we've been able to uh, negotiate to a successful conclusion. Shia Wei Wong back in November, and then Michael White uh, this last week. And Brett, you'll, you'll sort of appreciate this and understand this. We have now won the release of two Americans with no pallets of cash, no, uh, no sanctions relief, and no change in policy. Our maximum pressure campaign continues. We sanctioned the regime yesterday. And I think this is another example that uh, our strategy is working. And I think a lot of people, if you would have asked them a couple of years ago, if we were going to undergo maximum economic pressure, diplomatic isolation, and um, restoring military deterrence against Iranian threats, people would have guessed that we, that would have been a bad environment to work with the regime to get Americans out of prison. But we've now done it twice. And there's now um, a few more Americans that are left. And uh, I released a video uh, on Friday about Murad Tabaz. And uh, so I'm working on getting the Namazis and Murad Tabaz and the remains of Bob Levinson 
back to the United States. So that's sort of the next focus. That's really great. It's it's wonderful to have Michael White back with his family, and it's it's a great that the administration is continuing to focus so much on these uh, these, these these folks that are being held uh, by the Iranian government. Yeah, and um, President Trump has now won the release of over forty Americans during just his first term. He has made this a big priority, and we're very pleased with the record we've had. There are many more Americans who are still wrongfully detained that we need to, re to release around the world, but it's been an amazing record. Yeah, I know with Robert O'Brien over at the, UN uh, at the National Security Council, this is gonna remain our top priority. Exactly. Um, so diving into our topic here, um, Iran and the UN Security Council, I think the audience might uh, benefit uh, for those of them who might not be as steeped in in these issues as you are, uh, for you to give an overview on just why Iran is so dangerous and why the U.S. is is exerting so much pressure on them. When you look at the Middle East today, the Iranian regime is the principal driver of violence and instability, uh, because for the uh, up until the time we took office, I'd say from about 2007 until 2017. Uh, the Iranian regime was able to run <clears throat> an expansionist uh, and, and sort of a very violent foreign policy um, around the Middle East. And they have the ambitions not just to dominate the Middle East, but to dominate the world. And that's why over the last 41 years of this regime, they have conducted terrorist campaigns on five continents. You really have to think hard about any other country that has that sort of capability and that sort of ambition. But this is a Marxist theocratic regime uh, that's uh, highly ideological. They have the ambition to create what um, has been called <clears throat> the Shia Crescent. And that, that crescent pretty much extends from Lebanon down to Yemen. And I remember in 2014, there was an, a member of Iran's parliament who bragged that the Iranian regime controls four capitals. And this has been their policy. They do want to make the Middle East in its image. And that would certainly be against um, American interests and against the interests of our partners and allies in the region. So, uh, you know, give you one example. After the regime came to power, they helped midwife Hezbollah. Prior to Al Qaeda, no non state organization in the world had killed more Americans than Hezbollah. Uh, that was succeeded by Al Qaeda. Uh, but this is a regime that is very deadly, very lethal. Uh, they conduct assassination campaigns around the world. They conduct terrorism around the world. And so for American interests, I think it's important to reverse Iran's power projection and to put in place a policy that helps Iran be at peace with its neighbors, even when it doesn't want to. And uh, we've got a good combination right now uh, that has really helped to, I think, reset deterrence um, we've, we've hit back on Iran a number of times when they have uh, tested our resolve to reverse the gains that they've made um, over, the, over the years that, that predated us going into office. And maybe apropos of the discussion we're having today, I think that the Iran nuclear deal has helped Iran advance its ambitions to dominate the Middle East. And the Iran nuclear deal had some modest and temporary non-proliferation benefits, but when you look at the cost that it has, it's come with an enormous cost on missile testing, ballistic missile testing, missile proliferation, regional aggression, hostage taking, um, the, the whole list. And we are very aggressively going after the entire range of Iran's threats to peace and security. Well, um, I, I think it's worth noting that wherever Iran's influence is, is most prominent, you see chaos and, and instability. You look at Lebanon, you look at Syria, you look at Yemen, across the board, um, Iran's influence tends to be very, very damaging no matter where it is most exerted. And I think you're right about that. The, and so let's get into a little bit more about um, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, the Obama administration clearly acknowledged that Iran was a, uh, a destabilizing force, but their strategy for dealing with Iran was to enter into a, a, an arrangement with them, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, better known as the JCPOA or the Iran Nuclear Deal. 
And that agreement was never approved by Congress, but it was codified by the UN Security Council Resolution 2231. So why don't you go quickly over what the what the perspective of the Obama administration was on, on dealing with Iran in this way, why they thought it would succeed and why it hasn't. The Obama administration, I think, decided to see if it could reach some sort of agreement with the Iranian regime on its nuclear program. And then over the course of a few years, there was some back channel diplomacy. And then the diplomatic space was enlarged to include the UK, France, Germany, Russia, China. And then together they negotiated what became, uh, as you mentioned, Brett, the, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It's a little bit misleading in its title. It's not really comprehensive. Uh, it's actually quite narrow. It's only limited to one category of threats that Iran presents uh, to security and peace, and that's the nuclear threat. But we know that Iran's threats are much larger than just the nuclear peace. And so um, we thought it was a mistake uh, for the Iran deal to, to limit itself to only the nuclear peace. It is also, I mean, there's no mention of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, which was a mistake because anytime you have a regime that has the ambition to develop a nuclear bomb it also needs the means of delivery to make it a nuclear weapon you have to weaponize the bomb and every country in the world that has pursued a nuclear bomb always pursues icbm capability so that they can deliver you miniaturize the warhead put it on the tip of an icbm and then you're able to launch it uh, against your adversaries the Iran nuclear deal is completely silent on ICBMs. And in fact, one of the other big mistakes about the deal was it eroded the prohibition on Iran's ballistic missile testing. When I was in the UN Security Council, I, I was the uh, lead negotiator for the Iran sanctions resolutions, working at that time for Ambassador Bolton and then for Ambassador Khalilzad. And we put in place a prohibition on ballistic missile testing. That was uh, given up during the Iran nuclear deal. And as a consequence, during the Iran nuclear deal, we have seen an increase in Iran's ballistic missile testing. That's very bad news um, for freedom-loving nations um, around the world because Iran wants to be able to reach out and hit its target at will, and you need, you need to have ballistic missile capabilities. So every time you happen to see in the news a ballistic missile launch, or a launch of a space launch vehicle, that is a cover for an ICBM program that we should be very alarmed about. So the, uh, um, the deal passed um, in terms of getting agreement among its members in 2015. It did not enjoy the support of the United States Congress. And as a consequence, it doesn't enjoy the support of the American people. I thought it met the criteria to be submitted to the Senate for a treaty, but they didn't have the votes. In the, in the Senate. So they found the votes in the UN Security Council. And then that is what became UN Security Council Resolution 2231, which you might say operationalizes the Iran nuclear deal uh, in a range of different ways. So what you're saying is that while the Iran nuclear deal uh, directly addressed um, the Iranian nuclear program, it didn't address terrorism, it didn't address ballistic missiles uh, programs by Iran, it didn't address the conventional uh, military threat of Iran. So in, in ways it was very narrow in its approach. But I've also heard people talk about how at the end of the process, Iran has uh, the ability to get a nuclear program anyway. So did it really address the nuclear threat at all? What it did was put in place a temporary uh, plan on Iran's nuclear program, but. Iran's nuclear infrastructure remains intact. When I was in the council, we were able to negotiate a prohibition on enrichment. Uh, so the regime was prohibited as a matter of international law from enriching nuclear material. That was given up. And I think when we're looking at the most volatile region in the world, no enrichment is the right standard. Once you allow um, a country like Iran to enrich, it causes other nations in the region who are Iran's adversaries to say, well, geez, if they can enrich, why can't I enrich? And I've heard some people say that the Iran arms, uh, the Iran nuclear deal helped avoid a, a nuclear arms race. We see it as quite the opposite. I know the prior administration went in with the goal of no enrichment, but 
they they abandon it. And we had in the, when when I was in the council, you had the permanent five members of the Security Council, including China and Russia, vote unanimously uh, to, for uh, banning Iran from enriching. So it was uh, it was it was very regrettable that uh, that happened. When Secretary Pompeo was at Heritage two years ago, and he laid out his 12 demands on the regime, if you look at the top of the list, it's restoring the UN standard of no enrichment. And that's very important, I think, that we do that. So when we look ahead to uh, our diplomacy, we, the, the President Trump would like to get to a deal that, that covers not only Iran's nuclear program, but also covers missiles and regional aggression. And also, we have got to put an end to the hostage taking uh, that this regime engages in for now 41 years. They use human beings, especially Americans, as political pawns. And so that's also very much a priority for us. So in in terms of the, the Iran nuclear deal um, and Resolution 2231, th there's a timeline for the expiration of various uh, UN Security Council sanctions. And one of those involves an arms embargo on Iran, conventional weapons, and you wrote in the Wall Street Journal that that particular uh, sanction is set to expire this October. And you also said that uh, in that article in the Wall Street Journal uh, that this that Iran is planning to upgrade its uh, quote aging air force, improve the accuracy of its missiles, and strengthen its ability to strike ships and shoot down aircraft unquote. Um, so there's a plan already in place. Iran is anticipating. Uh, the expiration of this arms embargo to not only improve its own capabilities, but also in all likelihood, uh, purchase weapons and export weapons to uh, to aid its uh, allies throughout the region and, and probably further to stabilize things. So the U.S. is trying to get this U.N. Security Council to pass a resolution to extend that arms embargo, right? How mm -hmm. How is that being received? Brett, that was a very good summary, very good tight summary of what we're facing pretty soon. So when we were talking about the Iran nuclear deal, um, the, the Iran nuclear deal itself commits the United States to suspending sanctions on the regime that used to be in place, sanctions on Iran's oil sector and sanctions on Iran's financial sector. And President Trump, when he left the deal, got uh, reversed that. And that has given us enormous leverage. Uh, when, when you see the massive results that we've had denying the regime many tens of billions in revenue it's because of what we were able to do after we left the deal uh, we were we were not able to touch oil sanctions and we couldn't touch banking sanctions so we moved you know very quickly to reverse that the other thing that then happened was in addition to us and un sanctions and european sanctions being lifted they also lifted a number of UN sanctions, the ones that were negotiated during the uh, during the Bush years and even the early Obama years. And so uh, the resolution, um, the, 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 the Iran deal itself in year five permits the expiration of the arms embargo on the regime. That, that would be this October, October 18th, year five of the deal, the UN arms embargo expires. Now, why does this matter? Iran is the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, and it's the world's leading state sponsor of anti-Semitism. And when a regime of this nature and this quality is allowed to freely buy and export conventional weapons, which include air, uh, attack aircraft, tanks, there's a long list, I talk about it in the Wall Street Journal op-ed that you mentioned, um, this has the potential to really um, destabilize the Middle East because, look, you don't even take, take my word for it, President Rouhani said that very soon we will be able to freely buy and sell conventional weapons, and he described the arms embargo expiring as a huge political victory. Anytime the regime is claiming a huge political victory, we should really pay attention because that's usually bad news for America, our partners, and our allies. And what we have said is the UN arms embargo under the deal is set to expire in November, sorry, October. Um, we would like to have the council extend the resolution 
by tabling a new resolution that accomplishes that objective. But if that effort is vetoed or opposed by any permanent member of the council, then we have the right uh, under resolution 2231 that Brett, you and I have been talking about today to take all of the sanctions that were um, lifted by the Iran nuclear deal at the United Nations and snap them back into place. It's called the snapback provision. Our first choice is to just simply do a clean rollover, an extension of the arms embargo. Um, we're very happy with the success that our strategy has had outside of the Iran deal. So that's where we have all of our focus. Anytime that we're having to deal with something in the Iran nuclear deal, it's a distraction. We'd rather go back to focusing on our strategy of maximum economic pressure and diplomatic isolation, standing with the Iranian people, restoring deterrence. That's the most productive use of our time. Uh, we are uh, spending a fair amount of time diplomatically trying to get the arms embargo extended, but one way or another, we're going to accomplish this. Yeah, it's, uh, could you go over how much reception um, you've gotten from other members of the, the Security Council about this? I know for that the Russian ambassador uh, and the foreign minister Lavrov have written that uh, they oppose an extension of the arms embargo and they um, have cast doubt on the U.S. authority to actually exercise the, the dispute resolution mechanism, which would be the process through which the U.S. could snap back those sanctions. Could you discuss, uh, so the Security Council dynamic, but also the uh, the Russian uh, position of that the U.S. doesn't have the authority to do this? So on the first piece, Brett, um, we have started our diplomacy. We negotiated, sorry, we, we drafted the resolution that would extend the arms embargo and also restore the travel ban on 22 Iranian terrorists. It used to be 23. Um, and we would like to add some more names to the list. Uh, so that's what this resolution would do. Uh, I have um, worked with a number of uh, Gulf countries um, and have gone to New York a couple of times to uh, present our resolution and to explain our thinking and to explain our rationale for why this is important. What's interesting about this particular file I have on Iran is there pretty much is no nation in the world that defends Iran. Uh, they are completely alone in terms of having no support for what they would like to accomplish. No one wants Iran to have a nuclear weapon. No one likes Iran to be at war with its neighbors. Nobody likes the hostage taking and the ballistic missile testing and rockets and missiles to Hezbollah and the Palestine Islamic Jihad and the Houthis in Yemen and the Shia proxies in Iraq and Syria. Um, this is something which there is no support for this kind of thing. Um, what we found, though, is that there are tactical disagreements uh, that we end up having with various countries. Um, I'll give you one example. The E3 are allies of the United States and I work very closely with them. We all have the same threat assessment. They see Iran the same way we do. We disagree about the Iran nuclear deal and that's not an insignificant disagreement, but we share the same threat assessment. And I think the press sometimes loses sight of that. I think they, on the Iran file, sometimes overstate the transatlantic rift. When you look at all the actions that the Europeans have taken over the last three years to um, isolate Iran and to put sanctions on them for terrorism, condemning a lot of Iran's behavior around the region, uh, that often gets underreported. With, with respect to China and Russia, um, there have been press reports that China and Russia look forward to selling weapons to the Iranian regime. I think we've argued that that is not in their interest uh, because China and Russia have interests that go beyond just simply Iran. And you know, if you're China and Russia and you want good relations with a country like Saudi Arabia, which was directly attacked by Iran uh, with, with missiles. And um, when you look at something like that, you have to ask yourself, why would you be selling weapons to Iran that would enable it to attack countries around the region? And I think this is the question that we're putting to a lot of people to really think about our, our shared interests in having a more peaceful and stable Middle East. I think Iran has been, has been at this for so long, for 41 years of running this terrorist foreign policy 
that we have become desensitized, many countries have become desensitized to it. And they kind of accept that it is just, well, this is what the Middle East looks like. I think if you can imagine a peaceful Iran, the Middle East starts to look very different. Now, we're not, we're, we're, this, is, this is not an endorsement, just so everybody's clear on regime change. The future of Iran will be decided by the Iranian people. It will not be decided by the United States government. I think that's the, that's the right policy. But our pressure campaign is making a huge difference and it's expanding the space for the Iranian people to have a more representative government, which is something which I think a lot of nations around the world hope that for the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think so as well. Um, getting back to the, um, the Iran nuclear deal. So in there, you described earlier how there's a mechanism inside of it to snap back sanctions. And the... There, so there's two elements to that I wanted you to expand on if you could. One is the Russian argument that because the U.S. left the deal in 2018, they're not able to exercise that option. And I know that you disagree with that. And uh, and you stated in your Wall Street Journal op-ed that uh, the U.S. will exercise that if they're not able to get a, an extension of the arms embargo through the U.N. Security Council. The second part of it is the fact that the E3 have already exercised it. The back in January, they already initiated the dispute resolution mechanism, the whole process to snap back sanctions. Um, I think the shortest amount of time that it can take is about 65 days under the timeline outlined in the in 2231. Um, but it still continues to this day, months later. So are they dragging their feet? Are they still just undetermined about whether the violations exist? Could you explore what, what that process looks like from their perspective? I think from the Iranian regime's perspective, I'll start there. I think their strategy is to wait it out until November. Um, they would like to have, I mean, President Trump has been very effective in them. I've heard a number of people in the commentary and say, it's not clear what our strategy is on Iran. I promise you, it is crystal clear to the Supreme Leader of Iran and to uh, everybody in his cohort. They understand this, this strategy very well. President Rouhani said that our sanctions have cost the regime $200 billion. Uh, when, you, when you think about how much money that, that the regime would have otherwise spent if they had $200 billion, you, I'll let your imagination sort of run wild with it because this is a regime that takes its oil revenue and its foreign direct investment and all its other sources of revenue and the IRGC and the MOIS execute its mission set around the world to terrorize other nations, to try to bring them within the Iranian orbit. And so I think the regime is seeing if their resistance between now and November is greater than our pressure um, in terms of whether the question is whether they want to come to the negotiating table. Uh, President Trump, he's had the door wide open for diplomacy during his presidency. You know, during the same period that the president has hoped to meet with the regime, he's met with Kim Jong-un three times. And the door is open. I think the regime is sort of waiting to see. But um, it's, it's a long time between now and November. We're going to keep our pressure up and hope that Iran's, Iran uh, meets our diplomacy with diplomacy. I think for the Russians and the Chinese on and the Europeans, you mentioned, Brett, the Europeans did initiate the dispute resolution mechanism, which is this mechanism under uh, the, the 2231 resolution that if brought to its final conclusion, if Iran does not address its violations of the deal, then under its logical conclusion, it would lead to the snapback of UN sanctions. And so the Europeans have started that process because the Iranian regime has violated its nuclear commitments under the Iran deal no fewer than five times. So the predicate has certainly been met to initiate the dispute resolution mechanism. And that process, they're in charge of that. We're not in charge of it. We support it, but that's already started under, under its way. I think China and Russia would like to sell weapons to the Iranian regime. But as I said earlier, we think that would be um, bad for everybody, including China and Russia. Uh, so we're gonna continue making our arguments there. And Brett, if you look at to get really wonky, if you look at paragraphs 10, 11, and 12 of Resolution 2231, it states very clearly that the United States has a right, along with seven other countries, to initiate uh, the snapback of UN sanctions, which, if you think about it, makes perfect sense. 
the United States was one of the countries that built the UN sanctions architecture over between 2006 and 2015. The Iran nuclear deal suspended those sanctions sort of now, and also more sanctions are gonna be falling off. As a permanent member of the council, uh, we would have that right to then uh, put the UN sanctions back in place if Iran is in violation of the agreement. Iran is in, they admit that they're in violation um, of the Iran nuclear deal. And so uh, this is under the plain reading of paragraphs 10, 11, and 12, very clear. Um, you, the Iran nuclear deal exists separately from 2231. It's related, but it's also, it's very separate. And we have a right as one of the, as defined in paragraph 10, we are identified as one of the countries that can snap back UN sanctions. And if, we're, and if, if, if we cannot get agreement uh, in the council to just simply pass a resolution that extends the arms embargo, then we will avail ourselves of those options which are legally available. Thanks a lot. Um, I just wanted to ask one final question before we turn yeah. to audience questions. Uh, and that is about time frame. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the snapback sanctions process has sort of a minimum uh, time allotment for different steps in that procedure. And if you add them all up, it takes about 65 days. Obviously, it can take longer than that because the Europeans are still enmeshed in their own uh, process. Um, but if the UN Security Council doesn't extend the arms embargo, which you said the United States is seeking to do, doesn't that mean that the United States is going to have to act sometime this summer to initiate that snapback process just to uh, to meet that timeline? Well, we're, we're going to uh, not say much about our timeline um, just because it concerns sensitive diplomatic discussions. But you are right, Brett, that there are uh, timelines uh, that are laid out in 2231 that we're obviously mindful of and, and, and very aware of. Um, we have been working at this diplomacy now for some period of time. Secretary Pompeo has been alerting the world uh, since, I would say, October of last year, maybe even sooner than that, that the UN arms embargo is going to expire and it cannot be allowed to expire. It was a mistake to ever include that in the Iran nuclear deal. And based on my sort of research and understanding of the theory for permitting the arms embargo to expire, in 2015, I think the Obama administration had hoped that five years into the deal, the moderates would be in power and that it wouldn't matter if the arms embargo expired because the moderates would be in charge. One thing that I'll say about our uh, uh, diplomacy and our strategy is we do not get caught or lost in this thicket of who are the hardliners and who are the moderates in the regime. No matter how many fake elections you have, no matter who the president is, no matter how many people are in the majlis, every single morning when people wake up in Iran, there's only one supreme leader. And this is a regime that has kind of a Westphalian storefront, but it is governed ruthlessly and brutally by this clerical and revolutionary oversight and they control this regime with enormous power. And the Ayatollah, when he sort of restructured uh, Iran after he became uh, in charge of the country, he wanted to beguile, the, the, especially the West, to make it look like any normal regime. You have a president, you have a foreign minister, you have a military. But in fact, the foreign minister is simply the minister of propaganda. The military itself you don't hear much about because the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is the heart and soul of Iran's uh, kinetic operations. And then you've got all these weird councils like the Supreme National Security, all sorts of councils that are run by clerics that all answer to the Supreme Leader. And so it's the opposite of the separation of church and state. Um, and this has been an enormous cost to the Iranian people. And President Trump, I remember when he was at the UN General Assembly for his first address there, said that the longest suffering victims of the Iranian regime are the Iranian people. And we have stood with them. We reversed the mistake that was made in 2009 when President Obama did not stand with the Iranian protesters during the Green Revolution. Every single time you've seen protests in Iran, the United States and President Trump, Secretary Pompeo, Vice President Pence, and myself have all stood squarely behind the Iranian people, especially in November. 
when there were protests in 31, all 31 of Iran's provinces. And one thing that I'm quite proud of and also proved the skeptics wrong, in all 31 provinces, there was not a single protest against the American uh, uh, regime, against the American government, American sanctions, or President Trump. They were all directed at the regime because the Iranian people know whom to blame for the diplomatic isolation and for the economic malaise that has sort of troubled Iran for 41 years. It's a kleptocracy. It's run by a corrupt religious mafia that robs its own people blind in order to export terrorism. And we've stood up to it in ways that have no historic precedent. This is a regime that is not used to being told no. And, um, but they're learning that um, we're serious about uh, reversing their gains and making the Middle East more, more peaceful. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to just turn now to some questions from the audience. Um, the first question is from Barbara Slavin, and she's asking, uh, the European High Representative for Foreign Policy said today that the, quote, U.S. cannot claim that they are still part of the JCP JCPOA in order to deal with the arms embargo. Uh, what's your response? And how do you intend to extend this embargo? So this touches on something we've already discussed a little bit, but maybe you can go a little bit more in depth into the differences between what the JCPOA is and Resolution 2231. Well, one of the things, if you look at it, the, uh, the drafters of Resolution 2231 knew how to disqualify people from having the right to snap back UN sanctions. And the only disqualification that was made in 2231 in paragraph 10, you see uh, mention made of the European Union, but then in par and, and that's along with uh, a number of other states. But in paragraph 11, the European Union is uh, not allowed to initiate snapback because it's not a state. It's not a. It's a. Um, uh, so it says very clearly. It talks about these states, and so um, there is no qualification of status in 2231. And the drafters knew how to disqualify um, entities. They disqualified the European Union, uh, but they did not say anything in there about one must be a, a member of the deal in order to initiate the snapback. It states the countries that have the right, and then it explains exactly how the mechanism works in paragraphs 11 and 12. And so uh, the European Union, uh, doesn't have um, the power to initiate snapback, but any of the other seven nations do. So uh, that's just the plain reading of the statute. Uh, there are other think tanks uh, who've done a, an analysis of 2231, and it's very obvious. The other thing I'd point out is President Obama uh, and many other administration officials all said that we do not need the permission of anyone in the UN Security Council to snap back UN sanctions. Uh, that was an assurance that was made to the American people, and that's borne out in the text of 2231. So we're on very solid um, uh, legal footing in terms of the availability of 2231. Our first choice is to be able to just simply extend the arms embargo, and then we can focus on our strategy. Yeah, I, I kind of see it as uh, the difference between a, um, a speech by a legislator and the actual legislation. One is the outline, the framework of what your objective is, but the actual technical enforcement and the means by which you reach that goal are expressed in the legislation that is enacted. And so while the JCPOA and, and 2231 have similar aspects to them, and the JCPOA is an annex of, of 23, uh, 2231, 2231 is actually the binding mechanism by which this process works, and that's where you need to focus. That's exactly right. Um, the second question comes from John uh, Kavulich, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the uh, the last names here. Um, he is asking, what options are available to the Trump administration to disrupt the export of oil and oil-related products from Iran, specifically to Venezuela? Can the Trump administration use the United Nations to implement decisions given the disagreement among the members of the UN Security Council. You have seen press reports about five Iranian flagged oil tankers that made their way uh, to Venezuela. You have 
um, one uh, kleptocracy coming to the assistance of another kleptocracy. Uh, it's really sad to see this because uh, Maduro has is obviously not acting in the best interests of his own people. And same with the Iranian regime. So these are birds of a feather. Uh, that's that's not a club that I think freedom-loving nations want to be a part of. The way that, um, if especially, look at Tehran compared to other cities in um, in the Middle East over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Compare it to Doha, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, um, Manama, number of cities around the region. Uh, and you look at just how much peace and prosperity they've been able to bring to their own people. Well. You know, Iran is one of the most heavily subsidized regimes in the world. And they tried to cut some of the gas subsidies in November. Uh, and then you had massive protests. The regime murdered one th uh, 1,500 of its own people, injured thousands, jailed anywhere between eight and 10,000 people for those protests. And so when you see uh, Maduro and Rouhani and the Supreme Leader getting together, you can assume that they're up to no good. One of the things that we've been able to do is um, four of those, four of the tankers that were part of the operation to uh, Venezuela did not make it to Venezuela. And that is a consequence of our very effective diplomacy. And so we're going to continue to do everything we can to uh, deny the regime from um, uh, exporting its oil. I remember when we got out of the Iran deal, uh, the regime was exporting 2.5 million barrels of oil a day. Secretary Pompeo set the target of zero. And there was a Reuters story last month that showed that Iran's oil numbers for April were at 77,000 barrels. So that is an enormous um, accomplishment in terms of promise made, promise kept. And the regime, the reason why the oil revenue matters is they spend it on terrorism and they spend it on missiles and they spend it on regional aggression and all these other things that Iranian people are certainly tired of, and we're very tired of it. Thank you. Um, I have another question um, from Kenneth Katzman from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, he's asking, since Russia and China are not going to accept the legitimacy of a U.S. unilateral sanctions on snapback, and they will likely proceed with planned arms sales to Iran, um, what, if anything, will the administration do about those Russian and Chinese sales? Well, that's kind of a glass half full question. Um, it sort of is, it sounds very, fairly defeatist to my way of thinking. Um, we were always hopeful about our diplomacy. As I said earlier, you know, we're, we're engaging with the permanent members of the council. Uh, we'll do everything we can to see if we can just simply have a clean extension of the arms embargo. There's a lot of innings left in this game. Um, we've made very clear what our preference is but I'm not gonna speculate on sort of worst case uh, scenarios. Thanks, Brian. I'm uh, very respectful of your time, and I know that uh, you are, have a very busy, busy day planned ahead of you. I know we uh, originally had scheduled this for the afternoon, but your afternoon got very full. And so I, I very much appreciate you spending the morning with us. Um, just as a, a final comment, what would you like uh, the listeners to take away from this discussion and uh, perhaps maybe clear up a few misconceptions about uh, the administration's position on this. Uh, Brett, I think the, the, the really key thing about Iran <clears throat> for anybody who is interested in this space is that if you want to be successful diplomatically, you have to have three things. You have to have economic pressure, you have to have diplomatic isolation, and you have to have a credible military deterrent to defend our interests and our personnel. And from the very beginning of this administration, we have based our strategy around these three tenets. And I, I think uh, some other countries take a different approach. It hasn't been as effective. This is, as I said earlier, at its heart, a Marxist regime. And it likes to probe with bayonets. And when it hits mush, it keeps probing. And when it hits steel, it starts to pull back. And that is at heart the nature of how this regime views the world. And what we have seen, my experience sort of uh, studying the regime is that timidity and accommodation invites more aggression. Um, there's no such thing as sort of a win-win mindset.
uh, in this space with the regime. There are certain languages that they understand, and it's and and we're speaking that language to the regime. And so we've been very successful with it. If you look at, um, and I would encourage the folks um, listening to this to go back and read, go to the Heritage website and read uh, Secretary Pompeo's um, speech. I remember then, this is now two years and one month ago, he made it very clear to the regime. He says, the regime faces a choice. It can either come to the negotiating table and resolve our differences diplomatically, or it can manage economic collapse. And today, Iran is facing its worst economic crisis in its 41-year history. That's mostly because, as I said earlier, um, they mismanage their economy and they steal the nation's wealth in order to fund foreign adventures. Um, but uh, we, we have been able to um, affect that and to, and to sort of expand the space for the Iranian people to have a more representative government. So they're facing enormous economic crisis. They're facing a crisis of legitimacy and a crisis of credibility with their own people. And the Iranian people have stood with the United States and this administration on our strategy because it has been so effective. And we know that we support their desire for a more representative government. That's gonna to continue to be our strategy. At some point, the regime uh, is going to, I think, as, as a matter of pragmatism, is going to have to find a way back to the negotiating table. We've had the door for diplomacy open wide I've been able to successfully uh, negotiate two agreements with the Iranian regime on, on consular matters. Um, perhaps that will lead to broader agreements. Uh, and so we're gonna continue doing what we're doing. I think if you go back and read that speech, you will find that we have executed our mission set just as we had promised. And so many of the results that we are seeing uh, today are the kinds of things that we expected would happen. And so uh, the president and his national security cabinet are very happy with the success we've had, very comfortable with the strategy we have in place. We're in no hurry. Uh, we know that uh, we've built a very strong hand over the last three years. Thank you so much. I know that everybody here uh, shares the concern in the administration about Iran and uh, is hopeful for your uh, success in this outcome. Thanks so Thanks much so for much. spending time with us today. And uh, please, we'll have you back in the future uh, to talk about your success and hopefully anyway. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Bryce.